This is Rob Gray from ASU and PerceptionAction.com. Today on the Perception and Action podcast, my interview with Mike Studer, president of Northwest Rehabilitation Associates. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Perception and Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, I want to look at a topic that I've been meaning to talk about more on the podcast for a while now, rehabilitation. To do so, I have an interview with Mike Studer, who has been applying many of the principles I've been discussing on the podcast related to motor learning to rehabilitation. Mike is president and co-owner of Northwest Rehabilitation Associates in Oregon. Mike has been a clinical specialist in neurologic physical therapy since 1995 and has published over 25 articles on topics ranging from cognitive rehabilitation, stroke, balance, Parkinson's, and health policy. In the interview, we discuss using dual tasks to encourage the development of proceduralized memories, constraint-induced practice, concussion rehabilitation in sports, and geriatric athletes. Hope you enjoy. Not ten years ago, I was a child. I was a good boy and you let me go. Now I'm on a talk show, talk show. Today my guest is Mike Studer, president of Northwest Rehabilitation Associates. Thanks for taking some time to talk with me, Mike. Uh, Thanks for inviting me, Rob. Glad to be here. To start off with, can I ask you a little bit about, tell us a little bit about your background and maybe also a little bit about your company? Sure. Uh, I've been a physical therapist for about 27 years. I'm a board certified neurologic clinical specialist. So that's where my expertise and passion lies. I also do a fair amount of work in geriatrics and uh, have kind of coined the term of geri athletics because I like to help older adults be able to perform well in competitive athletics. As far as my company, we're an outpatient rehabilitation clinic based in Salem, Oregon, and we do orthopedics, neurology, geriatrics, and uh, pelvic health. So what is your kind of general approach or, you know, if you have a general philosophy about rehabilitation that you use? Sure. Especially in the world of neurology, I've got uh, a lot of approaches that center around the primary principles of neuroplasticity. I'm a very firm believer that when challenged, the brain can make changes. Uh, And one of the things that uh, I stipulate is that the equation of neuroplasticity is much like the laws of finance in terms of supply and demand. Uh, However, they're reversed in neuroplasticity where it's demand and supply. And therefore, if the task is presented or the therapist can construct an environment that forces a demand from the learner's brain, the learner is much more likely to be able to supply the skill necessary to meet that demand. Well, that's a really interesting way to look at it. So you you kind of have to, I guess, keep pushing the demands, uh, right, for to, to get that kind of uh, equation to work, right, in your, in your rehabilitation. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, and there's been quite an evolution in rehabilitation where we've gone from you know, maybe helping people a lot and putting our hands on and giving a lot of verbal cues, but not really giving much demand, not letting them error or make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Uh, And rehabilitation has evolved such that the pendulum sometimes goes to the complete other side of things and allows too many errors. And if the learner's not seeing any success, then the brain also sees the, you know, no impetus and no reason for and no thrive. Uh, So there's a good fine balance where the most skilled therapy, in my opinion, has a, a fine balance of demand and supply and success. So if we maybe if we can get into a bit more of the specifics of some of the things you do. Uh, one of the things that I, was really interesting to me is using something that I use as a research tool for, for uh, rehabilitation is using dual task training. In particular, mm-hmm. I know you talk about using it to try to encourage the development of proceduralized knowledge and proceduralized memories in, in rehabilitation. Can you talk to a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, so particularly in the world of stroke rehabilitation, where a learner might be uh, trying to regain the capacity to walk again. And all of us know that uh, the action of walking is largely a background activity, as you've already referenced, and your listeners are probably very familiar with uh, procedural memory means. 
uh, essentially able to operate uh, with some degree of automaticity, doesn't require a lot of uh, cortical and cognitive involvement to be able to run the task of walking. And uh, many times in rehabilitation for an individual recovering walking after stroke, therapists are inclined to direct a lot of cues at the body part, at the specific movement, uh, which tends to uh, put the task of walking where it never used to live, up into the frontal lobe, on the motor strip, and causing the individual to process the task of walking in a very cognitive step-by-step manner. Uh, so what we are evolving toward is utilizing the introduction of a secondary task and sometimes a tertiary task to distract the individual away from uh, that part task uh, compartmentalization and very cognitive drive of walking and forcing them to process the task of walking in a much more procedural memory manner down into the basal ganglia, cerebellum, premotor cortex, etc. cetera, uh, so that when they're out in the world and distractions happen, uh, that their walking doesn't have to fall apart. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, and for the dual task, what kind of dual tasks do you use? Do you use kind of like completely irrelevant things, or do you try to get them to f- focus on some kind of external aspect of walking, like where they're headed, or, or what kind of things do you yeah. do? Good question. So the uh, above all, the secondary task has to be of sufficient cognitive load to be able to borrow attentions from the learner away from their walking. So number one, you got to look at the load and you got to look at the dosage. Second, if you're actually in training. It is very apparent, and this is certainly true across so many aspects of uh, sport and rehabilitation, you want to engage the learner. So the more irrelevant or gamey uh, or contrived that you would make a distraction, the less you would assume that the learner is engaged, attending, uh, and feeling compelled to see a reason why this distraction would be something that they should be able to and would want to eventually be able to tolerate. So you want to make it very task and person specific. Okay. And I'll get to some uh, some you know very good examples for you too. But to answer your question, I also want to say in testing to see the capacity of dual task tolerance is completely fine to make tasks that are uh, built for testing for them to be very contrived and irrelevant. They don't have to be very task specific. The distractions themselves should come in one of four different modalities. Uh, so we separate them into cognitive tasks, uh, something to think about, uh, motor tasks, something to manipulate potentially with your hands if the primary task is walking, auditory tasks, very obvious, uh, and then also visual. So in those four different modalities, individuals may have uh, strengths or weaknesses in one, uh, but not exhibit those strengths or weaknesses in the other. So we look and we build our training around whatever weaknesses that they've got. Uh, now to get into the specifics, uh, I might be doing something with an individual that includes them trying to open their wallet up while they're walking, pull out a driver's license and hand it back over to me, something that they should be able to do. Pull out a handkerchief out of a pocket, clean your glasses off, but continue walking without losing your pace uh, or your balance. A couple of just real easy examples there of thousands of which could be discussed. That's really interesting. You, you've, so you've, you find that people can handle some modalities of dual tasks but not others when, when they're depending on the individual? Absolutely. And that's going to be true for all of us, you know, pre-stroke or pre-injury. And uh, those things can be even superimposed based on the type of lesion that happens in the brain. If you can imagine having a stroke maybe up in the right hemisphere uh, of the brain, uh, parietal occipital, maybe I've got a visual field cut uh, that happens, uh, a loss of some vision that would also superimpose greater difficulties for me to be able to tolerate a visual distraction. So depending on lesions in multiple sclerosis, stroke, etc., I may have a greater need in one of the modalities, but then also pre-injury, I may also have uh, skills and capacities that would uh, need some trainability or be a particular, you know, a f- skill that I've got uh, that doesn't need trainability before an injury. That's interesting. And so you, you generally find you get better kind of 
uh, walking behavior when you when you introduce the, the dual task. Um, what what happens when you you know you're still noticing some kind of maladaptive things? Do you, do you kind of have to do a balance of coming in and correcting and focusing on the body, then getting back to the dual task? Yeah, that's a great question. It all comes down to the learner's personality. The number of errors that a person is willing to tolerate, the amount of losses of balance or pathway deviation, or if they even see themselves having to come to a complete halt and they have to stop walking. Uh, if that's going to be frustrating to an individual, then I'm going to have to back my dosage down just a little bit, possibly even provide some corrections to them. If a learner, because of a traumatic brain injury, has almost no awareness to the fact that they're losing their balance because they're completely distracted away uh, by the secondary task, then absolutely, as a therapist, I've got to step in and keep them from injuring themselves. Yeah, that that must be a tricky balance to to walk back. The other one I want, another one I wanted to ask you about was um, what what I saw you mentioned constraint induced practice. I think you call it. Can you tell us a little sure. bit about that? Yeah. Uh, so in constraint-induced practice, again, the most common application might be going back to an individual that's sustained a stroke that has uh, perhaps some left-sided hemiplegia, so weakness on uh, the left side of their body. And if you can imagine, again, keeping this uh, underpinning theory of demand and supply, uh, there would be occasion for me in an effort to rehabilitate someone's walking and get them to be more symmetrical, that I might want to particularly load the left side of their body and to make it a little bit harder, i.e. add a constraint, so that they have a superimposed demand that they need to overcome uh, to keep the left side now up in pace, perhaps while walking in a body weight supported or harness supported uh, environment on a treadmill. To be very specific about that, one constraint that I might do, even though the left leg is the weak leg, I might have someone try to ambulate on the treadmill with a five pound weight around their left leg. And if you can imagine imposing that constraint delivers a level of demand and causes a greater amount of attention to come from the brain. So the motor program that's sent down to the left leg to haul that five pound weight is now much greater for them to try to be successful and keep up. Perhaps a minute or so into that effort, I might rip that weight off of their foot and all of a sudden we've got an individual who says, wow, my left leg doesn't feel like it is so heavy and so burdensome and cumbersome. Uh, so we've got obviously the dopamine, the endorphins, the motor control that's uh, risen to the challenge of the constraint. Now the constraint's removed and they're feeling much better about this. And we've got a more rigorous and tolerant uh, motor program that's come as a function of the practice. That's really interesting. So it's almost kind of opposite what you would think, right? Of so, you know, putting it more demands on something that that's struggling, that that's a really interesting approach. Yeah. 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 And there's many different iterations beyond the weights of the ankle. But hopefully that's a one good analogy for your learners to see then too, or for your uh, listeners to see. Yeah. No, I think that's an interesting way to do it. Another thing I've, I've seen uh, that you do in your group is doing uh, concussion rehabilitation for sports, which I know is a really is a big topic now. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do there? Yeah, so concussion re rehabilitation has really improved in sophistication over the last five to eight years. Uh, we've gone from uh, uh, have the individual stay away from phones and screens and get into a dark room and uh, really stay quiet with no stimuli for a 24 to 48 hour period and uh, what the evidence in concussion rehabilitation uh, has helped us to understand is that uh, a more gradual introduction of light exercise, uh, a reduction overall of the stimuli that could be noxious, uh, and a reintegration a little bit more expediently than what we had been doing is beneficial for people recovering from concussion. The Benefits of light exercise for brain-derived neurotrophic factor, for the true physiology of, you know, everything that's happening that comes from exercise, circulation, attention, 
and metabolism is all very good as well. And so we start off with an introduction to light exercise, and then we look at what type of concussion symptoms this individual is expressing. Uh, those could be vestibular, those could be visual, uh, they could be headaches, uh, they could be muscles that are more related to whiplash, uh, they could be imbalanced, or they could be cognitive. And so we look at any one of those different uh, aspects or presentations and subtypes of concussion and treat that individual in a very individualized manner that brings that type of rehabilitative approach at them. Oh, that's really interesting. And I guess, a lot, like you were saying, there's, there's been a lot of advances. I guess a lot of the advances have come on the diagnosis evaluation side as well. Have you, have you seen that as well? Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, imaging lacks very far behind in concussion, and that's okay. Uh, but there's really not a gold standard for uh, using any type of definitive test in imaging that says concussed, yes or no. Uh, but the respect of the medical community to be able to say that even though we don't have imaging, to recognize this as a brain injury, uh, to recognize that there's really no pharmacological intervention that is going to be warranted here, tells people in the medical community that we've got to find another way to uh, advance these people. And that is partially by not, you know, prescribing so much bed rest, getting a little bit of activity going, uh, and then uh, really looking at the specific type of concussion uh, that people are presenting with and not being just so bold and across the field, everyone has to follow this protocol. And probably one of the biggest advances that I would uh, suggest uh, also you know, folds back into that topic we were just talking about, and that looks at cognition and the tolerance of dual task for the concussed individual because their likelihood of returning back to sport and sustaining a second concussion or more uh, is ultimately tied to their capacity to handle the high speed demands of their sports that include not only the motor aspects, but also the decision-making aspects. And so a big advance there is that uh, dual task as a screening uh, and as a barrier to say, pass this test in order that you would uh, be given uh, you know, permission to return to sport. Yeah, no, I think that I agree. It's a really good kind of basic test to do. I wanted to come back to another topic that you mentioned right at the start. I, I was uh, very interested in when you talked about the work that you do with um, you know, geriatric community in terms of athletics. And so maybe can you tell us a little bit about what kind of why that's so important to keep doing sports in old age, older age and kind of what you do to help support that? Yeah, absolutely. So the American College of Sports Medicine has clearly identified uh, the dosage of what should be coming in for exercise prescription, uh, whether that be for strengthening, for muscular endurance, uh, for cardiovascular endurance, and also to some degree, but there's some gains to be made there, uh, also in balance uh, and in flexibility. And those standards are rarely applied to the, our senior athletes uh, or even to community-dwelling elderly. And we know that if we're not keeping up fitness conditioning across all those paradigms, individuals as they age will naturally, as a function of aging, lose type 2 muscle fibers preferentially, and as well as many other changes uh, that we see in terms of nerve conduction velocity, which we can't change, uh, and that's going to impact balance. Also changes at uh, the level of you know cardiac output, stroke volume, max heart rate, etc. Uh, and we can go on about the changes that we can and cannot do something about that are obligatory in aging, but we understand that if we don't introduce a regular stimulus that people that are above 65 years old and that decade from 65 to 75, they're going to lose 10% of their strength if you're not giving them a strength stimulus. The strength stimulus is very clear. The prescriptions are uh, very clear. And we now know that the muscle, even in aging, is going to respond in the same physiologic manner uh, as it were if it were younger. We can't expect people to get back to, you know, the strength that they had at age 18. But if we're not giving them the dosage, they absolutely will lose it faster than they did from 25 to 35. It's very dangerous because it's going to lead to other controllable uh, health problems that they didn't have to have. 
So we like to advocate for the participation in sports that engage individuals and keep their total package of fitness up for them to uh, continue to participate in, uh, you know, maybe it's like that 102 year old runner that you might have seen stories about that's still out there. And, uh, you know, everybody wants to just be as active yet also as safe as they can be. And uh, we want to keep that capacity up. Yeah, no, I agree. That's, that's really, really important. And it's good to see someone focusing specifically on the sporting aspect of it. Uh, I guess the, the last question I have for you, Mike, is, is kind of a general one about some of the c- kind of other practical advances you've had in, in rehabilitation as they relate to kind of motor learning. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I appreciate you asking that. So I, I'd say one of the largest advances in regard to motor learning January 2016 seminal article uh, from Rebecca Luthwaite and Gabrielle Wolf, shedding light and bringing uh, to the world of rehabilitation the optimal motor learning theory. And uh, some of your listeners and yourself, I'm, I'm certain, would be familiar with the optimal uh, motor learning theory where uh, we're talking about optimizing, uh, you know, uh, p- performance and learning through, uh, you know, intrinsic motivation, attention, and really the three major underpinnings of the optimal uh, to be just boiled down would be the sense that when the subject, the player, the learner has some autonomy in the tasks that they're using uh, also. So that'd be number one, autonomy. Number two, the feedback that people are receiving has more of an external component rather than an internal component less information about the movement of the body part and more information about the end result or the production. Yes, you were able to hit it to right field rather than did you bar your lead arm, uh, you know, as you're uh, driving that ball. And then also the third aspect. So we've got autonomy and, uh, you know, external feedback. And then the third aspect being enhanced expectancies. Uh, and that is that degree of success that every learner old or young, impaired or not, needs to have to continue to drive their attention and motivation uh, and to be subservient around the brain level changes that are happening to create learning, releasing more, you know, brain derived neurotrophic factor, having that dopamine release when you see yourself uh, achieving something good. So it's that degree of success uh, and the countable, uh, measurable, objective nature of that success that a learner can take with them. Yeah, no, that's really great. I, I agree with you. That's a really nice uh, model. I, it's good to see it's being applied to to the rehab setting as well. This has been really great, Mike. Thanks for taking some time to talk with me. Sure. Thank you so much for your invitation, and I'll look forward to uh, continuing to listen to the wonderful podcast that you produce. Thanks again for the great discussion, Mike. You can find out more about Mike from the links I've posted in the show notes. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials including transcripts and an extra monthly episode, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Cut you quick.